Okay, next we're going to take a look at species and speciation, the idea of how new species can arise from other types of forms. So if we look at all the different types of species that exist just for birds, we've got uh, thousands and thousands of different types. Same thing for all types of other animals and organisms and plants and fungi and bacteria. And we keep finding and discovering new ones. So let's take a look at how this actually works. We got to think about evolution in terms of allele frequencies. Well, what does that mean? Remember that a gene can have several different forms. If it has only two different forms, then that's what we're used to. It's two different alleles like big B and little b. Sometimes we can have multiple forms of the same gene. And I mean more than three or more than two, three or more. So for example, blood types have a IA form, an IA allele, an IB allele, and a little i allele that uh, ends up producing blood type O if it's inherited in the homozygous recessive form. The gene pool is saying at any given time all the alleles that are present in a particular population. So if we're looking at frogs or if we're looking at humans, like for example in humans we might be saying what is the allele frequency for for example the cystic fibrosis gene and you can actually try to calculate that and we're going to actually do some of those calculations a little bit later on in this evolution unit um, but for example if 15 out of 15 individuals one of them is carrying uh, this particular red allele then we can calculate a frequency okay the imp an important thing to remember is that the dominant allele frequency plus the re recessive allele frequency is equal to one and we'll look at this in more detail because if you're homozygous recessive then we're going to count that as two of the alleles that are present in the total population so evolution specifically involves changes in these allele frequencies. At any given time, we can calculate an allele frequency, for example, for the cystic fibrosis gene or for the sickle anemia, sickle cell anemia gene, and we can try to find out how prevalent it is in the actual population. Now, evolution specifically involves changes in those allele frequencies. So over time, if we see, for example, the sickle cell anemia allele frequencies start to increase, then that means something's going on in the population. Maybe there's an advantage to having that sickle cell anemia allele. And we've seen that to be the case, for example, in uh, combating malaria. So in places where there's a high frequency of malaria, we tend to see a higher, a higher allele frequency for the sickle cell anemia allele. So that's an example of natural selection happening and then evolution happening as a result of this natural selection. Keep in mind that mutations are always occurring. So these allele frequencies are constantly changing and sometimes it may take a very, very long time for us to see significant changes in allele frequencies because a lot of the times uh, some of these mutations, they're kind of self-correcting mechanisms. So not every new mutation is going to result in an advantage for that particular individual. In fact, most of them are probably bad genes and will get eliminated. So don't worry about this equation too much. We're going to do practice with this when we get to that part. It's called of the Hardy-Weinberg uh, equilibrium and actually try to calculate these frequencies. But for now, just understand that evolution involves changes in these allele frequencies over time. Ah, uh, yes, something I hear more or less often. See, Larry, there's nothing wrong with you. Let me replace it with C, Alex. There's nothing wrong with you. You're such a nice guy, but it's just that. I guess it's time for me to move on to find someone from a better gene pool. That's all. I happen to think my genes are okay, but uh, it's a matter of opinion. When it comes to trying to define new species, scientists have a few things they agree on, but there's a lot of gray area as well too. So genetically speaking, a group of organisms showing an identical genetic karyotype, like a diagram over here, would be considered a species. The human karyotype has 23 pairs, the last pair of which are considered the sex chromosomes. But this has got me thinking, identical karyotype. So all of us have this same karyotype, but someone with Down syndrome, for example, has three copies of chromosome 21 or trisomy, trisomy 21 is what it's called. But we don't really consider them a new species, do we? So I guess there are some chromosomal abnormalities, but maybe that's allowed within the definition of species. There are other ways to define species by breeding. I mean, do they naturally breed together or do they not? Do they avoid each other even though they're 
gametes are physically compatible. Ecologically, if they're overlapping in the same environmental areas. Evolutionarily, by looking back at their relationships with other organisms. And that can also be described as a cladistic method of defining species. And we're going to break that down in a little more detail later. So in order to create new species, there have to be reasons for why a group would kind of start to separate and stop interacting with the previous one enough so that we can say, hey, that's a new species. I've discovered a new species of beetle, for example, a new species of bear or a new species of fish, for example. So these are some specific examples of barriers that could arise between gene pools. So something has to happen to separate these gene pools enough so that we can actually define them as a new species. So it could be genetic isolation. The gametes may not be able to actually interact with each other. They can physically meet, but they will not actually fuse. So for example, take a, a human sperm cell and a donkey egg cell. They're not going to actually be compatible. So a zygote's not going to develop. Temporal means having to do with time. So it could be different peak times for breeding activities. So some animals uh, or if you're looking at a specific organism, one group of those organisms start being ready to reproduce during the summer and others during the spring. And then so if that becomes incompatible, you can start to have a group starting to separate out. Ecological isolation is talking about actual different physical habitats. So maybe the pollen cannot actually reach another, another particular area. So that's an example of ecological isolation. Behavioral isolation a lot of animals or organisms or whatever we're talking about in their effort to actually attract mates, maybe do specific dances or produce specific chemicals. And if you can't respond to those chemicals or those dances just aren't sexy enough for you, then maybe you stop responding and then there will be no compatibility as a result of behavior. Another thing is you could actually end up producing, I mean, a sperm cell and an egg cell could actually be compatible together, but the resulting offspring may be sterile and th in this case uh, here we have a horse plus a female donkey male horse plus female donkey ends up producing the infamous mule mules unfortunately are sterile with 63 chromosomes they are not going to be able to carry out uh, meiosis effectively to actually produce viable gametes so those are some examples of barriers that can arise between gene pools Another way that new species can arise is through something called polyploidy. We as humans have two sets of homologous chromosomes, one that we've inherited from our fathers and one we've inherited from our mothers. But some types of organisms have more than two sets of these homologous chromosomes. They can be considered triploid, tetraploid, pentaploid, or hexaploid for six copies. And when these chromosomes are separating during metaphase, specifically metaphase 1 and the formation of gametes, we can end up with errors that are happening through non-disjunctions. So if they're supposed to separate equally, but you know two go over here and one goes over here, or if you have more copies, three will go over here and two go over here, you can end up creating uh, these errors, basically, that can help to actually produce new varieties. Okay, Most of them might actually not be able to develop properly, but some just might be able to. And so this is one way of speciation happening and we see it a lot in plants uh, one weird super weird example ophioglossum reticulatum a specific type of plant actually has 1260 chromosomes to divide during meiosis making it there's no special word for it 84 ploid instead of hexaploid or diploid remember we are diploid our body cells are diploid cells so it doesn't necessarily mean that the more chromosomes you have the more complex of an organism you are because Justin Bieber is way more complex than this. And one final thing to discuss with regards to speciation is the difference between allopatric and sympatric speciation. I like to think of the word sim as same location, same location, and allopatric means uh, separated population. So once again, the definition of speciation is the process by which one or more species arise from previously existing species. So allopatric speciation is talking about a specific geographic barrier. So if 
landforms change and you end up growing a river a river develops between two particular areas or you actually have a lake and the lake starts to evaporate and it ends up turning into three separate smaller lakes that's an example of allopatric speciation some kind of geographic barrier tectonic plate shifting elevation of mountain ranges uh, those river and lake examples that i just talked about that's allopatric sympatric sounds like same so this is actually not as clear, not as clear, but people think, and from some of the examples that you saw earlier in the video, you have a species that's living in one area, but some other type of barrier may be causing the new species to arise. And it, and they could just be still like crossing, crossing paths and living in the same environment. So that could be reproductive isolation or gamete, gametes being isolated or behavior, something like that. So that's called sympatric speciation, when individuals acquire different traits while being in the same geographic area. Okay, that's it for speciation and how new species get created. We're going to go on and look at specific ways that evolution can happen.